Okay, so finally, to close this module on evidence-based policing is learning objective number four. Now, I'd like to provide a few challenges that you're going to face in taking on this innovative approach to policing. While much of what I have said may seem logical, change is hard for anyone, not just law enforcement agencies. Police have been doing their jobs in the same way for years, and habits and traditions are very hard to break. Just take a look at your standard operating procedures manual. The vast majority of that manual does not speak to what you should do to be proactive, focused, or place-oriented in between calls for service. It primarily focuses on calls for service, arrests, and uh, procedure. So when you become a patrol officer, you're going to naturally begin to focus on responding to 911 calls and making arrests because that's how police procedures often define the role of police officers today. Now, ironically, this type of reactive policing can lead to boredom, stress, lack of motivation, cynicism, and lack of professional challenge or satisfaction in your jobs. Further, it can lead you to become ineffective in terms of reducing crime in your beat if you only focus on traditional reactive approaches to policing. So in this last learning objective, I like to point out the aspects of policing that may impede your uh, interest in being more evidence-based. And I think identifying the, these aspects can help you quickly identify them and overcome them as you make your way through the policing profession. First, there are systems in the police organization that can inhibit you from carrying out uh, evidence-based approaches. Now, we've already covered the 911 system. Training in academy and field training tends to revolve around responding to and waiting for calls for service. You've got to keep reminding yourself that the gold in policing is not just the call or the arrest. It's what you do in between those calls for service that matter. Second, the patrol car can inhibit officers from actually getting out of their cars, which is key to not only conducting proactive foot patrol, field interviews, and interactions with citizens, but improving visibility in hard to reach places and improving your relationship with informal guardians. For those of you who patrol suburban areas, there are going to be apartment complexes where there are entire areas of the apartment complexes that are not accessible by your vehicle. So making it a habit to get out of your patrol car and doing that often can lead to a very effective approach in policing. Third, the police organization also defines the role of your first line supervisors, who's usually a sergeant, sometimes a corporal, to play a very passive role in policing. That is, his or her role is primarily defined as being responsible to read and approve your reports, respond to difficult or serious calls for service, or deal with disciplinary problems or officer accidents, injuries, and shift schedules. However, supervisors who encourage proactivity, develop team-based tactics, work with their squads to address problems through problem-oriented policing, are beginning to be more regular fixtures in policing. Now, I mention this because policing is notorious for a style of supervision that is hierarchical, reactive, and discourages rank-and-file innovation. So a discouraging supervisor may inhibit you from taking these types of approaches, and it's just something to be aware of. Fourth, in policing, effectiveness and good policing is often associated with arrest. So there's this obsession with arrest that blinds officers from focusing on preventative measures that can avoid the call or arrest from happening in the first place, which is a positive thing, by the way. Further, patrol officers are highly trained on proper procedures of arrest, and what this means is that they are often less trained on other important approaches to policing, such as those that are proactive, place-based, or tailored and focused to specific problems. Fifth, you may be impeded by a lack of crime analysis at the patrol level. Hotspots maps may not be made available to you on a regular basis. Some of you may find these maps online. You're going to have to be creative. Local universities have students with GIS skills who might be interested in helping. Your city or county government may also be mapping crime for other purposes. 
or your agency may indeed have a crime analysis unit at the headquarters level that would be glad to help out if just asked. And finally, you may not necessarily be rewarded for using effective police practices. Rewards in policing often do not have to do with how well you keep crime at bay, but instead how many arrests you make, how well you follow standard operating procedures, or even uh, seniority, for example, the number of years you have on the force. Again, these are bigger issues that have to be addressed by your agency more generally. But know that more and more agencies are taking the approach of measuring success by proactive, place-based, and focused policing. They're measuring success on how you lower crime rate as opposed to how many arrests you make. Some of the most prestigious awards given today in policing, such as those given by the POP Center or IACP or our center, uh, do not only reward bravery, they also reward officers who take proactive, preventative, and evidence-based approaches to policing. There are also cultural factors in policing that inhibit carrying out an evidence-based approach. Science and knowledge from research is not necessarily what is valued in policing. Rather, other things are more highly valued, and these things might be hunches and best guesses, what you did yesterday and if it was successful, anecdotes and stories, emotions, feelings, whims, or stereotypes, political pressures and moral panics, or sometimes uh, something called best practices, which is kind of a consensus-based approach on what tactics and strategies seem to work best. Okay? Now, granted, sometimes hunches and feelings are useful tools in policing, but officers also want to make decisions based on as much information as they can obtain, rather than just guessing. At the same time, many of these mentalities are valued as uh, something called experience making scientific research even harder to enter the conversation. Police and many other types of practitioners often value experience over other sorts of knowledge. What I'd like to do in, in these final slides is just to give you some common rebuttals to an evidence-based approach that you might hear when trying to carry out some of these strategies. For example, some might argue that you're too busy that there's no downtime in between calls to be proactive, place-based, or focused. And this is actually a very common belief that officers are so busy that they don't have time in between calls to do anything else. It's as almost as common as another myth in policing that directed patrol displaces crime. Both of these ideas are incorrect. There is time in between calls and crime is not easily displaced. So remember, we know now, even in cities with high amounts of violent crime, anywhere between 40 to 80% of an officer's time is not answering calls for service and is completely uncommitted. The time in between calls is the gold. What you do during this time matters. And finally, if you are in a high call volume beat or area, the ultimate goal is to reduce the amount of calls for service that you get, which can be done through proactive, focused, place-based policing. Another common rebuttal to evidence-based approaches that you might hear is that experience is more important than these other sources of knowledge. And again, this is also not true. First, experience is a very subjective term. In some progressive police agencies, experience involves evidence-based, problem-solving, proactive approaches. Second, an officer's hunch or experience may be wrong. Sometimes relying on our personal experience can lead to harmful, incorrect, or biased policing. And this can include racial profiling, policing by stereotypes, or emotion-based policing. All of these things work against an officer's legitimacy and ability to be effective. Further, although gut feeling and hunches can help us in very specific, tense situations, most of policing is not these situations. Often you have the time to put on 
what I like to call your thinking cap, C-A-P, and that is having, being critical, analytic, and proactive in your thinking, which is different than being reactive, procedures-based, or linear in your thinking. Third, experience and knowledge, research knowledge, are not mutually exclusive. Both can help you be a better officer, and it's important to develop a balance between having good experience and also knowing the research knowledge. For example, even when you get to a hot spot, uh, hot spot to patrol, what do you do while you're in the hot spot can draw on both experience and all of the research knowledge available to you. And finally, to address this issue that experience is more important than what experts or researchers are saying who may have no experience, many scholars and researchers ha who have evaluated police tactics either have been or are currently police officers. All of the studies in the matrix come from partnerships between researchers and police officers who care about policing and crime prevention. Just as your weapon, vest, procedures manual, vehicle, and radio are essential pieces of equipment and protection against crime, so too is research knowledge, and many of the top law enforcement officers in the U.S. recognize and take advantage of this knowledge. So, in conclusion, I really encourage you to remember these general crime prevention principles as well as the challenges that you might face in implementing them in uh, patrol. Your effectiveness as an officer depends not only on your response to calls for service and following standard procedures and the law, but also in your knowledge about what makes officers more fair, more effective, and more legitimate in what they do. Mm -hmm.